please welcome developer advocate from Google, Pamela Fox. Hi everyone, how are you? Good, very good, all right. That's, I think that's the coolest entrance I've ever had for any conference. This uh, is pretty amazing here at Developer Day 2010. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming to my talk. I know that we're in a really far away building right now, so I appreciate that you guys had to walk quite a long way to get here, and I'm glad you made it. Hopefully uh, you'll learn something from this talk. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I, uh, my name is Pamela Fox, and I got my uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree in computer science from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, California. And uh, then I started working for Google, and I started on the Google Maps API, and was on that for three years, and I've given a few Maps API talks here in Tokyo at developer days and at hackathons, so maybe I've met some of you at those. And then for the last year, I worked on the Google Wave API. Uh, unfortunately, Google Wave uh, was canceled, so now we're working on open sourcing it. And uh, nowadays, I'm just using every API that we have <laughs> and having fun. Um, so obviously, as you can see, like I've, you know, I've worked on APIs for pretty much my entire professional life. And uh, I really like APIs. I wear shirts about APIs. APIs are really cool, um, but you know I want to talk about what actually an API is, because uh, you know in the web we like to make up these words and they can be ambiguous. So the term API has been around for a long time. It's an acronym. It means Application Programming Interface, and uh, it originally was used to describe any time that you have an interface that one software uses to interact with another piece of software, right? So when I was a kid, there was the, I thought of it as the Java API, right? The Java API was how you wrote programs using the Java language. So that was the original meaning of API. Now, the, we had the web, right? And on the web, websites started making ways for other websites to interact with them and to get data from them. And so when they created these ways, they also called them APIs. So then we had web APIs, so that one piece of web software could interact with another piece of web software. Um, so one of the earliest web APIs that I remember was the Flickr XML RPC API, which is a, it's a very cool API. Thank you for tweeting. I should probably turn that off. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's a web API. Um, the, the original web APIs were uh, XML RPC, they were SOAP, um, stuff like that. So I call those server-side APIs or HTTP APIs. These are APIs that you're typically using from your server scripts and you're interacting with using HTTP, GET, POST, DELETE, et cetera. And um, you know, they're your typical APIs like the AdWords SOAP API, the Amazon APIs, the Flickr APIs, um, et cetera. Uh, then we have client-side APIs. And I define this. I, I made up this term this morning. Um, but I would call client-side API is a web API that you can use entirely in the client. So using only HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you can use a client-side API. And you can still use this API in order to get data or functionality from somebody else's server. So we still have this cross-server communication, but done entirely inside the browser, right? Um, so an example of that is the Google Maps API, right? When you're using the Google Maps API, all you have to do is you know, open up a text file on your computer, write some JavaScript, and you have a map. So you've, you've done that, you've accomplished that using entirely client-side technologies. So originally, I titled this talk JavaScript API hacks, um, but now I'm, I'm going to retitle it, and luckily I've got Strikeout, so I can do that. So now I would say we're talking more about client-side APIs, because there's some APIs that you can use with just HTML. You don't even need JavaScript, right? And I don't want to exclude those, because there's, there's a lot of stuff you can do. 
So that's what we're going to be talking about is client-side APIs. Um, now, the thing is that, you know, we talked about server-side APIs and client-side APIs. It's always actually been pretty easy to use server-side APIs because it's always been easy for a server to open a connection to another server and read in the data. But it hasn't been as easy for a client to get data from another client, right? Client technology is actually, you know, it's kind of younger. You know, HTML has been evolving for the past, you know, 20 years or so. So before we actually talk about different client-side APIs, um, I want to actually talk about the history of client-side APIs, because I think it's actually kind of cool how we evolved to the state where we can actually have client-side APIs. Because when the web first was born, it was impossible, right? HTML didn't allow for that. But we've evolved since then so that we can actually have this talk. So I, I did a lot of research, and I thought it was kind of interesting. So um, I start off with that and uh, you know, basically bring us up to modern day. So in 1990, that is when Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet, right, or invented the World Wide Web. So he created the first web browser and the first HTML. And the cool thing is that you can actually still look at this first HTML page. So here, this is the very first web page on the internet, right? So when he first created HTML, it pretty much was just text and links. But that, that was what he wanted. He wanted ways of con connecting different nodes of information together. And the cool thing, you can, you can view source on this and, uh, and look at the source. And some of it looks kind of weird, right? Header. Um, we actually do, you know, we, we don't have header anymore. We have head. He doesn't even have an HTML tag at all. He does have a body. Um, we still have anchor tags. So there's a lot of it that's actually the same, right? So it's, it's pretty cool. And the fact that this still renders today um, in a modern browser, that really shows you the point of HTML is that, you know, as you keep adding to it, you still support these, these old, older versions. And, and the browser is smart enough to figure out how to render this page. So there's the very first web page. So it was just text and links. So we could, we could link to other people's servers and link to other people's data, but we couldn't directly bring it into our web page ourselves. Now, in 1993, three years later, Mark Andreessen was working on the NCSA Mosaic browser, right? And he, they needed a way to have images. So you, you, can, you can look at their discussions. But he basically invented the image tag and implemented it and launched the Mosaic browser. And that's why we have the image tag. So if you look back at the history of HTML, the reason that a lot of HTML tags exist is because somebody needed it, they implemented it, it worked, they launched a browser, and it became the, the standard, right? So he created the image tag. Um, and with the image tag, you could actually have you know, the source attribute point at anywhere on the web. So that effectively was a way, uh, the first way of bringing data from other servers onto your web page, right? The data was only an image, but you can, you can actually do stuff with an image. So I don't know if you guys remember it, but hit counters were really popular, right? Every single web page had to have a hit counter so that everybody knew how many people were visiting your web page. And I, actually, I think it's kind of cool. I think we should bring it back. Um, but a hit counter was just an image, right? But it was, like a, it was like an API. So we look at the image tag here, and it has a source which points at another person's server, and it has some parameters, the counter ID, and it has a template. Right? So this is an API. I've passed in some parameters. I'm communicating with the server. And the server is responding to me with an image that represents the data that it knows about my hit counter. So this is really, I'd say, the first client-side API in the internet were these hit counters. And they still work today. All right. Uh, 1995, Netscape and Sun introduced JavaScript. And you can actually still read the press release about it. And it's, it's a really cool uh, press release. It has all these quotes from people about how JavaScript is going to revolutionize the internet. And uh, it, the quotes were actually correct. I think that JavaScript really did um, change a lot about the internet. So JavaScript meant that we could dynamically create HTML. It meant that we could dynamically create image tags, right? So it didn't really 
give us more of a way of bringing in data, but it did make our pages more interactive, and it did eventually lead to these other things. 1996, Microsoft introduces the iframe element. Um, so iframe element, you guys are probably familiar with it, basically it's a way of embedding a web page inside your own web page, right? We had frames before, but iframe could be used anywhere on the page. It can even have zero height. Um, now, people figured out that with iframe, you could actually use an iframe element to do some communication with the, um, with the embedded iframe uh, URL thing. So you could use the iframe to, to get some data. Um, and here's a, here's a demo I found that actually it still works, and it was, it was from the 1990s. So I click test, and it tells me the current server time. So this is actually interacting with a hidden iframe that's on the web page, right? So the iframe was um, one of our first ways of dynamically getting, getting data in, um, but most people didn't know about this hack. Now you notice Microsoft introduced it, and Microsoft sometimes gets a, a bad rap, but Microsoft was actually responsible for a lot of the things that let us have client-side APIs today. So we, I really have to give them a lot of credit for, um, for coming up with this stuff. 1996, uh, Macromedia launches a Flash player and, uh, and Swift files, right? You could create these animations, output Swifts, and then they could be embedded on pages. And they were embedded using elements that already existed, um, object and embed, and using standard plugin APIs that were already being supported. Um, so Flash, it didn't give us that much more than JavaScript at this point, but it was, it was very graphical. Um, you could embed Swifts from other people's websites. You could embed like a game from other people's websites on your page. So it, it was along the way of, of giving us more, more stuff that we could take from other people. 1999 was when Microsoft, once again Microsoft, introduced XML HTTP requests. So XML HTTP requests meant that at any point, you could make a request to your server, ask for some data, basically ask for a URL, get back that data, and display it in your web page, right? I'm sure you guys are, are, you know, have all used XML HTTP requests. I have a simple example just to remind you uh, what it is. So if I go, and let me show you the debugging. So throughout the talk, I'm going to sh you know, show you how I actually do some of the web tools that I use so that it helps you when you're, when you're doing stuff. So for XML HTTP requests, um, I usually you know, click on this XHR console here, click go, and you can see it's my name. And if I look at this, it'll tell me what the request was. So I can see the header. So here's the URL that it got. It's another URL just on the same server. And it's a simple URL. It just contains my name. And I can see the, the content of that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to disable this now. All right, um, now if we look at the source, uh, we can see creating the XML HTTP request. So there, for a long time, there were two different ways of creating it, since Microsoft did originally create it as an ActiveX object, but it is now standard. Um, so we create that. We do a get. So with XML HTTP request, we could do a get or a post um, to our own server. Um, and then we can go ahead and say what's going to happen when that request comes back. We're going to take the response and just put it on the page. And then we just send the request off. So that's XML HTTP request. Um, and Microsoft actually started using that in, um, I think it was called Outlook Web Access, um, was one of the first applications that, that used it so that it could be a bit more dynamic. Uh, so that was in 1999. And it, it took a while for web developers to actually start using XML HTTP request. Uh, it wasn't until 2004 that Google launched Gmail. And Gmail was you know, kind of one of the big example applications of XML HTTP requests. And then Google Maps in 2005. Um, and they actually, they both used a combination of XML HTTP requests and the iframe hack that I talked about earlier. Um, as part of this research, I actually went back into our code history in, uh, in our, Google, you know, our Google internal code base and looked at all the change lists to try and figure out when we first use XMLs and when we first use iframe. It's, it's really fun, actually, to look at that. Um, so yeah, so 2004 and 2005, Google starts innovating um, with, these, with these XML HTTP requests and showing what a web application could look like and kind of showing, you know, making that popular. In 2005, uh, we finally get the term AJAX. So uh, Jesse James Garrett, he created this term AJAX, which is now, you know, really well known. 
And he used it to describe this new style of web applications, the style like Gmail and Google Maps, where you're just pulling in data without ever refreshing the page. Right? So the user visits a web page once, and from then on, everything is just fetched. So it means that there's a lot less um, waiting time for the user, and there's always something for them to do, because this part of the page is being fetched while this other part of the page is still there. Right? Instead of having the, you know, you have your page, then you wait for 10 seconds, and you have your page, and you wait for 10 seconds, you're just filling in bits of the page. Um, so we define this Ajax. This is the, the diagram that you first came up with to describe this new model of web applications. And as soon as he created this term Ajax, now that people had a word for it, it started to actually become uh, a lot more popular. Right? This, this is when everyone started wanting to do Ajax programming. And um, popular JavaScript libraries built in Ajax support, so prototype and, and jQuery. They would have methods where you could just do you know, jQuery, it's dollar sign dot Ajax, right? Um, so as soon as it, you know, this happened, we started seeing everybody uh, doing things using Ajax. Um, now, Ajax was still only a way for getting data off your own server. Uh, in Internet Explorer, there was actually a security setting where you could get data off of anyone's server, but you know, most people didn't have their, um, their thing configured that way. So we could only get data off of our own server. But this whole dynamic web application thing got people thinking about how they could start getting data from other domains. Right? They wanted to have part of their application here and part here and get some data here. So it, people started thinking, like, what, what can we do? How can we actually get some more data from other people? So uh, in 2005, December, um, this guy named Bob Ippolito, he was working on uh, MochiKit, which is a, you know, that was a popular JS framework. And he described and coined the term JSONP. So JSONP is a technique similar to Ajax, where you can actually get data into your page at any time, but it can be from anybody's server, right? And what it uses is basically hacking the script tag. Um, and I, like, I, you know, when we say hacking, it's kind of an ambiguous term too, but you see with HTML that a lot of the stuff we do, it's, it's you know, we, they created all these elements in HTML, like iframe and XMLH free requests and script tag, not knowing how web developers were going to use them. And then web developers, like you guys, start using them. And, um, and then it, it, they're basically, you know, you're hacking them, but I don't know, the, the web just evolves depending on how we use it. So it's, it's no longer a hack, now it's a best practice. Um, but here's a simple JSONP example. So looking at the source of this. Um, so what we've done here is that we've got our HTML, and we have a script tag that points at a, a PHP file on my server, and uh, it gives it a callback. So it says callback equals this. So that's the name of a callback function. And then I define that callback function right above it. Right, so I say, all right, parse response is going to take in an object and uh, write out the name key in it. So we can look and see what this, this thing returns here. So on my server, um, you can see it returns back just a string that's basically a function call, right? So when the web page, when the browser reads in this JavaScript file, it will actually attempt to call the parse response function and since I have defined that function right here um, as, a, as doing this, then it, it'll call this function, and this function will execute, and then it'll display the name below it. Um, so it it's, it's really is a hack, but it's very cool. So uh, debugging-wise, when we're trying to figure out what's going on here, once again, the console tab, and then click scripts, because we're not doing XHR anymore, we're actually just loading a script tag, so we need to look at scripts. And we'll once again see headers, and we'll see content. So this is our you know, little bit of JavaScript that gets executed. And if you look on the server, this is what the actual PHP file looks like. So I find out what they want the callback function to be called, and then I echo out the callback function wrapped around the JSON object, right? So this is a very basic JSONP. Um, and it's really important to understand this, because JSONP turns out to be the basis 
for pretty much every JavaScript API that's out there today. Um, because it is the way that we can get stuff from other servers. Um, now, uh, there's, you know, that example there, I had to, you know, only get the JSON when the page loaded. We could also get it on demand. So here, I can just say, all right, load JSON now, and it displays my thing. So how this differs is that instead of hard coding the script tag at the bottom, I dynamically create the script tag. So here I say, all right, document.createElement script. There's my callback name. I'm going to set the script source, append that script to the body. As soon as that happens, the browser tries to execute that script tag, and it sees that there's a JavaScript function call in it. It ends up calling parse response and, uh, and then doing the result there. So now we have a way of getting data from other servers having that other server effectively call a function on our page that we tell it, and um, being able to do that at any, at any time during the, during the page load or during the user interaction. All right, so that was JSONP, and that was coined in 2005. So um, that was important. Um, around the same time, in June 2005, that's when we launched the Google Maps API version 1. And this is one of the first JavaScript APIs, that, at least that I knew of. Um, it still it wasn't actually using JSONP yet. It was really just creating image tags on your page and configuring it so that the image tags looked like a map. But it was nice because it was actually showing how you could have a JavaScript API to get functionality from another server. And most people would use the Maps API in conjunction with XMLHP requests on their own server. Now, in May 2006, Google launched the Ajax Search API. And this was actually an API that got data uh, from our server. So this was an API that let you embed a search box on your site and display the results. And the API used JSONP behind the scenes. So let me just show that. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So here's a search API, so I can go and search for my name. All right, so then it shows me results. If I look at the uh, console here and look at the scripts, I will see here uh, this request to the G web search URL. So this is a massive URL, which is basically specifying all these different parameters, like Q equals Pamela Fox is in there. And then the content that we get back is this long, JSON result here. So it's a little hard to actually uh, you know, read that response. So what I would typically do uh, here is go to jsonlint.com. This is another one of my essential tools. So if you are dealing with JSON, highly recommend it. And I'll just go and put the uh, JSON in here. And it will pretty print it. So now I can look and see what it looks like. So in fact, what this JSON is, is a series of results. Um, it's an array, basically a JavaScript array of results, and every result has a title, um, a URL, uh, content, and some other information. So this is JSONP being used behind the scenes, and uh, they basically wrap it up inside of an API that makes it a little bit easier to use. So if we look at the actual search API, uh, you can see we load in the API from Google, and when the page loads, we create a new search control, and we add it to our document, right? But when anyone actually does a search, this API, behind the scenes, uses JSONP to get that search data from the Google server and pull it into the page. So this is the first uh, JSONP API that, uh, that I know of, or at least that we had at Google. In June 2006, just a month after that, we launched geocoding in the Google Maps API. And this is really similar to, uh, to the Ajax Search API, where once again, we were getting data from the Google server. So if we look at scripts and we do a search, we'll go for Tokyo, we will actually see the geocoding request in here. So we can see the request URL once again. Uh, there's parameters in there. And the response is JSON, right? And here, it's actually been pretty printed already. So we can look and see the lat long and the bounding box and all of that information. And that's wrapped up into a API as well. 
All right, so those were, that's basically kind of the history that brought us to the point, right? We had HTML, then we had images, iframes, Flash, JavaScript, and finally JSONP. So these are all the ingredients that we need in order to have client-side APIs, right? And these are the things that you, know, you have to understand if you're somebody who's actually creating a client-side API, right? Like we, we did at Google, or if you're using client-side APIs, really helps to understand. All right, so now let's actually look at some client-side APIs that Google offers, besides the, the search and the maps that we already saw. So one of them is the Charts API, the Google Charts API. So this is actually an image API, really similar to the hit counters that we had way back for counting visitors. This lets us construct a URL, create an image tag pointing at that URL, and then have a chart on our page. So you can see some of the standard charts that it has there, you know, bar charts, pie graphs, et cetera. Um, this, you can also do kind of crazy ones. So this is a spiral chart, and I think it uses some function definitions here. So you can see 1.5 times y, 1x, 1.5 times z. So you can actually pipe in formulas. So if you're, if you're good at math, you can create really beautiful things like this. Um, I'm not good at math, so I just copy the docs. But um, that's a really cool one. Now, you can, always, you can use these charts anytime on your web page that you need a chart. And uh, you actually saw, all of you saw the charts API in your dev quiz emails because you got a QR code. And that QR code was generated programmatically using the charts API. So it, it doesn't make just charts. It, it makes any, like all these different types of images, including charts and QR codes. So here's a cool mashup that my colleague made, which basically lets you check which countries you visited and get back this image that represents it. And then you can go and embed that on your, on your page or whatever. So I can go and say that I've been to China and I've been to Japan and I've been to Australia and United States, et cetera. So if I actually look at the image URL here, you can see this is a charts API URL. And uh, it's got different parameters in here. We've got you know, the chart type, the chart size, chart data. So if you look at this data, you see you can actually read it, China, Japan, Australia, US. Um, so that's, you know, that's cool. That's, we can go and take this thing and embed it wherever we want, share it on Facebook, et cetera. Now we have the Google Visualization API. So this one um, lets you use JavaScript to build charts. So it's similar to the last one, except this time we're actually, you know, it's a lot more interactive. We're using JavaScript. Um, and then, you know, embed those on your page. So here's the basic example. So my daily activities, you can go and get little info windows. And if we look at the source for that, we have to load in the visualization API. And then we create a data table. And in the data table, we have numbers of columns, similar to a spreadsheet. And you add rows representing your data. And then you say what type of visualization you want to make. So here we're making a pie chart visualization. We're drawing it into the page, specifying some parameters, like the fact that it's 3D. So to do a demo of that, similar to our last one where we had the country visited, I wanted to actually be able to rate different countries, to tell people what I've thought of the countries that I've gone to, right? So here I have the country rater. So I'll start off with Australia, since I live there now. And I will give it a 8. Um, so here I'm actually using a little bit of HTML5. This is input type equals range, which is, gives you a slider, which is nice. Um, I'll go ahead and add America since I was born, was born there. And I'll give it a five. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and add Japan since I'm here now and give it a 10 to impress you guys. All right, so now I've got this chart and it's interactive. If you guys have ever used Google Analytics, this looks a lot like the chart in Google Analytics. I think it's the same, the same code base. Um, so we can go and mouse over and actually see the different ratings. And if we look at the source for it, um, it's really similar to the last one. After we you know, give those inputs, all I do is iterate through all those input sliders 
And for each of the input sliders, I get the value of the slider. I add that as a row to my data table. And then I create a new GeoMap visualization. Um, so the code is, is very much the same to the pie chart. I've just made it a bit interactive, right? Um, I should also make it a little more shareable and viral and all of that too, but you get the, uh, the idea here. All right. Uh, then we have the AJAX search API. I've already talked about the search API, but only when it launched. So when it launched, it was only web search, but now it's got like six different types of searches. So we can do image search, local search, news search, blog search, et cetera. And my favorite one of these is image search. Um, I mean, the first API I ever used, or second, was Flickr API, and I had so much fun doing image-based mashups, because, I mean, everybody likes the visual of images, and you can really get creative with um, image search. So uh, that's a cool one. So I won't show the example again. I'll just show the image one. So here is a mashup called Imageizer. And what we do is we enter in a poem or a phrase or something. So I've already pre-filled it with a Japanese whatever I think when I'm in Japan, which I want sushi and sake in my stomach. So I'll imageize it. And uh, now I've got a visual representation. So what I've done here is um, for every word, except a few that I've kind of blacklisted, I go out to Google Image and actually uh, get the response for each one. Um, so it works pretty well with food stuff. Um, doesn't work as well with other stuff. Uh, let's see. It is a I, so I only brought <laughs> Dr. Horrible. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you can see it gets a little more abstract depending on what you put in it. Uh, but yeah, I, I only brought my summer clothing, so I'm a little bit upset right now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's Imageizer. And if we look at the source for that, um, basically what we're doing is we're, we split the phrase that we put inside that input box. And um, for each word in that phrase, we do a new image search. And uh, I put safe search to strict because I don't want to accidentally show something bad on the thing here. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically every time we get back a search result, we add the thumbnail, so TB URL, thumbnail URL. We add the thumbnail URL to the page, and then we go out and fetch the next result. So that's kind of a fun thing that you can do with image search. OK, um, there's also the Google Ajax Feeds API. So uh, this is an API that's using the Google Reader technology. Um, I don't know if you guys use Google Reader, but it's, it was one of my first like, favorite Google applications. I would just sit there day after day scrolling through items. Um, so yeah, so we're, Google Reader is constantly going out on the web and fetching feeds and caching them. And it has this huge database of feeds. And uh, we figured that other developers would want an easy way of getting feeds as well, uh, and maybe not have to use the server for it. Um, so we came up with the Ajax Feeds API. So it lets you specify an RSS or an Atom feed, and then it gives you back that feed as, uh, as JSON. And then you can go and use that feed information in your page. So we'll look at the basic example. So that just was four titles from a feed. So what we've done here, uh, that's actually from dig.com. So we create a new feed pointing at the, the RSS URL for dig. And when the feed is loaded, uh, we iterate through all the entries in the feed. And we add the title of the entry to the page. So that's a basic feed API. And for a demo of it, I'm actually going to show you my home page, because my home page is entirely based on the feed API. Um, because uh, you know, home pages are really easy to get out of date. Right, you make your home page, you forget about it. Three years later, you have to update it. So I figured there's a lot of information about me on the web already. I should just have a home page that has one sentence and pulls everything else from the web. Right? So then I just update the stuff that I'm already updating. So everything you see there um, is pulled in from a feed. So I have my tweets. That's an RSS feed. I have my blogs. 
And those are two different feeds. Oops. Um, I have my code. So you can actually get um, an Atom feed of all of your Google code commits. So you can actually see these are, <laughs> these are all commits that I was making two hours ago for this talk. Um, you can see my pictures. This is from a Go workshop that we just had at Sydney. Videos, cartoons I've made. So it's all being just fed from all these sources on the web. So it's a, it's a really cool thing is that a lot of people offer feeds right now. So if we look at the source, you'll see that um, I'm basically specifying all these different URLs from Flickr and Twitter and uh, YouTube, uh, Google Code, and then creating either what I call a link bar, where I just create links with titles, similar to what we just saw, or an image bar, where I'm actually getting a thumbnail from the feed and putting that on the page. Um, but it's actually, it's really, it's really basic, but it, it's cool that uh, I can do all this simply using that Ajax feeds API. So you're welcome to you know, copy and paste it and just replace it with your own feeds. <laughs> All right, the Google Ajax language API. So obviously, Google Translate is um, you know, one of the tools that we're uh, kind of proud of. It, it does these nice machine translation. And the language API makes it possible for developers to use Google Translate capabilities in your own applications. And it's, it's got a few different capabilities. It can do translation. It can do transliteration. Um, it can detect language. So give it a string of text, and it can tell you what language it thinks it is. And uh, it can also have a virtual keyboard that you can put on the screen. So here's a very basic example. And what it's doing here is we're loading the language API. We're first detecting the text of the language. Uh, we could have hard coded it, but here we're detecting it. And then once we find out what the language is, uh, we translate it from um, that language to the next one and just put out the translation. So that's a basic example. So last night, I was trying to think of a good example for that. And I didn't link it, so we'll just search for it. Um, so there's this really cool game. <laughs> Ignore that. All right. <laughs> that's, a, that's for a demo later. Uh, <laughs> there's this cool game that I uh, used to play as a kid called Telephone. And it's called different things in different, different languages. But basically, Telephone. You know, like 15 of you sit in a circle, and one person whispers something to the first person, and then each person whispers it to the next person after that. And then at the end, whoever's last will say what it sounded like. So it's usually kind of hilarious, because it will transform some from one thing to something completely and utterly different. So it, it's kind of this, you know, this interesting game that's just for fun. So I decided to do that using the Google Translate API. So here's Translation Telephone. And you enter a sentence, and you pass it around. Um, so the massive monster ate 100 hot dogs and puked orange all over his wife. <laughs> this is my sample sentence. Um, so it'll go ahead and put it through 20 different languages and show the results. And they're randomly picked from all the different languages that it supports. <laughs> so it's 100 monster-eating hot dogs. <laughs> And orange and waste of votes for her husband. <laughs> um, so you get these really, and every time I do it, I get a different result because I, I randomize the, the languages that I'm, I'm outputting from and going, you know, basically the circle. So you, you get different ones all day. So I, I've been playing around with it for the last day. Um, we'll try something. Google Developer Day is filled with the smartest developers in the world, and they're all in this room. OK, let's try that. <laughs> Looks pretty good. Everyone, most brilliant programmers in the room. Yeah, that one actually works pretty well. So depending what you put in, um, you can actually you know, get it completely weird, or, or it'll actually work. Um, so you can have fun playing with that. But basically what I've done here, here's all the translation, the languages that I'm going in between. And um, I'll, you know, basically I create an array of randomized of 20 different languages from that list. And uh, I first I detect your language. So you guys should try it with Japanese. I, since I don't speak Japanese, it was hard for me to try it. But 
see if it works, because it should detect the language and um, you know, translate from that original language to the next one. So it should work in any language. And it uh, basically just goes through, very similar to the image search, but instead of searching for images each time, we're just translating from the first language to the next language each time and outputting the result. All right, uh, now we have the Google Data APIs. So uh, we have a lot of Google Data APIs, and they're both, um, you know, usually when you use them, you use them as server-side APIs, but you can also use them from the client side. So Google Data APIs let you get data from a, a lot of our Google products that have user data, right, which is actually quite a few. So YouTube, Picasa, Spreadsheets, Blogger, Buzz, Calendar, there's a lot of public data in there. Right? So anytime there's public data, like somebody has published their blog or published their calendar or published their Picasso album, anytime there's public data, you can get that using the Google Data APIs and using their JSON-C output. And, uh, and then you can use that using the JSON-P technique that we showed earlier. So I'll show you uh, YouTube JSON so you see what it looks like. So here, the URL that I'm putting in is gda.youtube.com, feeds, API videos, Q equals surfing, alt equals JSONC. So I'm basically saying, give me all your public videos that match the query surfing, and give me it as JSON. I could also put in GDD, get back all the GDD ones. Um, and there's lots of other different YouTube feeds that you can use. So uh, yeah, so and this is, uh, what I'm using here to actually get a nice pretty view of the JSON is the JSON view Chrome extension. So once again, if you're dealing with Chrome, I recommend you download this extension. It really uh, makes it much easier to interact with JSON. And you can basically, you know, we've got hierarchy and nesting and everything. But this is what the JSON looks like. And we can, for every video, we can get all this different information about it and then read that into our page. So as an example of using JSON, um, I'd actually, my example is this presentation right here. So this presentation, um, it's a HTML5 web page, and it's pulling all the data from a spreadsheet. So here's my spreadsheet right here. And uh, if I want to, let's find what, what page we're on right now. I can actually go and change this. Hello, Tokyo. Reload the page. There we go. All right. <laughs> so um, we can go ahead and view source on this. And if you view source, what you'll see is that there's a script tag at the bottom of the page, that first JSON technique we showed, where it specifies a callback on spreadsheet load, specifies my spreadsheet URL, and then on spreadsheet load is my callback function that reads into JSON, iterates through every row, gets the title, the content, creates a slide, creates the header, creates a section, et cetera. So that is how I use the data APIs so that I could have this presentation and separate the, the data from the, uh, the presentation. Um, another example is this game I made. So do you guys know Memory? Memory is a game where you try and flip over pieces and get matches. OK, apparently it's end now. Um, so here's Memory using my public album. I have to match. I'm not very good at matching right now. Oh, here we go. All right, so I got a match. <laughs> and I'll go through and get more matches. So this is just grabbing public feeds like from Toru and Fred and stuff like that. All right, um, OK. So it says we're at end. All right, um, there's also the Gadgets API. And that lets you go and load gadgets into the page. So you can see these are basically mini web pages that are just iframed on the page. So this is using iframe technology. And uh, we can go and add a gadget to the page here. And it's a very basic one. And I'll show you what that gadget, so that's what the gadget looks like. It's basically an HTML web page. It's surrounded by some XML metadata so that the gadget container knows how to load it. So gadgets are nice because they let us uh, add gadgets onto gadget containers like iGoogle and Spreadsheets and Orkut. But you can also add these gadgets to your web page. So they make your little applications a little bit more portable. All right, so you can combine these together. And I'm out of time, so I'll just show very quickly. Um, this is a Google API timeline. This is pulling from a spreadsheet and visualizing using the Google Visualization API. Um, 
this, I won't explain. Uh, this is a photo layer map, which is using the Maps API to visualize data from Picasa and Flickr. And it's actually doing bounding box searches every time I change the location of the map. So if you work with geographic data a lot, a lot of APIs let you do bounding box searches or radius searches. So take a look at that, because then you can just pull in only the data that's uh, in the area. So here's, I just found a from Google Developer Day last year. Uh, here's flashcards. This is a spreadsheets gadget. And um, basically here we have a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet where we have some words. And then we have these flashcard gadget that lives inside the spreadsheet. And I can go ahead and test my knowledge of the words. And I can use, I'm once again using the image search API. So this looks like a book to me. Um, oh, and also the translation API. So I can translate to different languages. So that's in Spanish, and I know what that is. Uh, and that's, uh, that's Fox, I know what that is. So this is using you know, about four different APIs to create these interactive flashcards. And then finally, RageTube uh, is a way of parsing spreadsheets that are online and loading them into the page and finding them on YouTube and uh, being able to view them. OK. <laughs> and uh, so in summary, um, pl I, please remember that the client is very powerful now. HTML has evolved so that you can do a lot more in the client than you can do when HTML was first invented. Um, so think about what you can do in the client versus the server, because it's always better when you can do stuff in the client and uh, take some load. It's not always better, but it's nice when you can take load off of your server and put it in the client, because then you know, it, it saves your server power um, and it's more efficient. Uh, when you do use an API, you are you know, saving time or money. Like most of the demos that I showed you took only a few hours to come up with. And that's because I was able to outsource most of the work to the APIs. And I was like, all right, API, you do this, you do that, and I'll just add a little functionality on top. Um, APIs, when we create an API, we create them for a particular use case. But you can really be creative with APIs and find new ways of using them, like to make games or to make learning tools or make maps, you know, all the different things that I showed. So you know, don't, don't think of an API can only be used for this or that. Just look at what it's offering and, and uh, be creative. And I also think they're really fun. I had a lot of fun making the demos for this. Um, so thanks for coming. And uh, you can go and get these slides. I'll tweet them out afterwards as well. But you can, uh, all the demos are linked. All this, the sample code is open source. So feel free to learn from it, copy it, branch it, fork it, whatever. And uh, I'll have office hours in the Cool APIs sandbox area on B5 after this. And you can tweet. All right. Done. <laughs> <laughs>